Hey, I'm Rob Witcher, and I'm here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major recovery strategy topics in Domain 7 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies and help you pass the CISSP exam. This is the fifth of six videos for Domain 7. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. The recovery strategies we're about to discuss are all about getting parts, systems, and even whole data centers back online if there is a failure, or building redundancies into systems. So there is no downtime at all in the event of a failure. The closer we get to making systems fully redundant to minimize downtime, the more expensive the solution is going to be. And conversely, if we want to save costs, it typically means longer downtimes in the event of a failure. Ultimately, what should drive the decision of how quickly a system needs to be recovered or the amount of redundancy required is a business decision. The owner of the system needs to determine what is cost justified based on their business needs. We'll start with backup strategies for data. Various methods we can use to backup data in the event of hardware failures. But before we get into discussing the strategies, let's talk about an important bit known as the archive bit. Metadata is data about data, and the archive bit is an example of metadata. Every file on a computer has an archive bit associated with it. If the archive bit is set to zero, no backup is required. An operating system will automatically flip the archive bit to one whenever a file is created or modified, meaning the file needs to be backed up. Now let's talk about different backup strategies. Mirror backups, also known as stream backups, is an exact copy with no compression, no attempt to shrink the backup file size, meaning mirror backups are very fast, but use a lot of storage space. Full backups are where every file is backed up, regardless of what the archive bit is set to. Full backups employ compression, so they're not as fast as mirror backups. Incremental backups are where we back up every change since the last incremental backup. Every time we perform an incremental backup, the archive bit is reset to zero for every file that is backed up, which means you are only backing up files that have been created or modified since the last incremental backup. This minimizes storage space required for backups, but can lead to lengthy recovery times as multiple incremental backup tapes may need to be pulled and run sequentially. Differential backups are where we back up changes since the last full backup. The archive bit is left set to one for every file backed up, which means during every differential backup, you are backing up all new and modified files since the last full backup. This uses more storage space, but speeds up recovery times as the maximum number of tapes you will ever need to pull is two, the most recent full backup and the most recent differential tape. Here's a summary of the different backup strategies. It is important to validate that backups are occurring correctly. This can be done in numerous ways, including cyclical redundancy checks, CRC checks, checksums, bit for bit comparisons of the backups to the original data, or just spot checking select files. And these verification checks can be done while the backup is being performed and also periodically on shelved tapes. It is important to think about where the backup data is being stored, how long it is retained, and how to make the backup process more efficient. Backups should be stored off-site, ideally in a geographically remote location from the primary system or data center. It's a wee bit pointless having great backups if they were located right beside the primary system that just burned to the ground or floated away in a flood. Tape rotation schemes are different methods of keeping backup tapes for a period of time and then reusing the tapes, overriding the old data with new data. The exact rotation scheme that an organization chooses needs to be driven by their retention policy, which is driven by regulatory, contractual requirements, restoration needs, and costs. The recovery point objective is the maximum tolerable data loss an organization is willing to accept as a measurement of time. Five seconds worth of data, five minutes, five hours, or five days, you get the point. I raise the RPO here as it is a major driver of the cost of a backup solution. The shorter the RPO, the less data an organization is willing to lose and therefore 
the more expensive the backup solution is going to be. So if an owner wants to reduce costs associated with backups, they may need to look at reducing their RPO requirement. Now let's switch topics slightly and talk about spare parts, spare power supplies, spare RAM, spare hard drives, any of the parts you might need to put in a system. A cold spare is simply one of these spare parts on a shelf somewhere. If the primary power supply fails as an example, the system is going to go down for minutes or hours or even longer, depending on how long it takes to get that spare part off the shelf and installed in the system so it can be brought back online. A warm spare is a spare part installed in the system but is not powered on and ready to go. With warm spares, if the primary part fails, the system is still going to go down, but recovery times will be much shorter as someone just needs to manually flip a switch to switch over to the spare part and get the system back up and running. Hot spares are spare parts installed in the system and powered on and ready to go. So if the primary part fails, there will be an automatic switch over to the spare part and the system will remain up and running. Now let's talk about how we can use multiple hard drives simultaneously to achieve greater speed, greater redundancy, or both. RAID 0, also known as striping, uses two or more hard drives. When a file is sent to the RAID controller, the file is split into two pieces. The first half is written to the first hard drive, and the second half of the file is written to the second hard drive. RAID 0, therefore, is all about speed, because we have essentially doubled our read and write speed, but at the expense of redundancy. RAID 0 at least doubles the chance of data loss because if one of these drives fails, you've lost half your file, which is essentially all of your file. So RAID 0 equals speed. RAID 1, also known as mirroring, uses two or more hard drives. When a file is sent to the RAID controller, the file is copied or mirrored. The first copy is written to the first hard drive, and the second copy of the file is written to the second hard drive. RAID 1, therefore, is all about redundancy. Because if we lose a hard drive, we have simply lost a copy of the file, and we have a complete copy of the file on the other drive. So RAID 0 equals redundancy. It's not listed here because you already know what it is. RAID 10 or RAID 1 plus 0 is RAID 1 and RAID 0 together. RAID 10, therefore, requires a minimum of four hard drives. A file is mirrored and then striped, creating four fragments of data which are written to four hard drives. RAID 0 gives you both redundancy and speed at the cost of a lot of hard drives. RAID 5 is meant to be the best of both worlds. You get nearly the speed of RAID 0, you get the redundancy of RAID 1, and you don't need as many hard drives as RAID 10. RAID 5 requires a minimum of three hard drives. When a file comes into the RAID controller, it is split in half like RAID 0, and then the magic happens. Some parity data is calculated using exclusive OR math. This magical parity data allows you to reconstruct either piece of the original file with the remaining piece and the parity data. The two pieces of the file and the parity data are written to the three hard drives. And here's a summary of the different types of RAID. High availability systems means we want a system that doesn't go down in the event of a failure. We want redundancy at the system level. We can achieve high availability through clustering and redundancy. Clustering means we have multiple systems working together simultaneously to support a workload. Think a cluster of web servers behind a load balancer. If one of the members of the cluster goes down, the cluster is still running, but it reduced capacity. Redundancy means there's multiple systems, a primary and one or more secondary systems. These systems are not working together. Rather, the primary is doing all the work. And if it fails, the secondary system will take over to fully support the workload. Okay, now let's talk about how we can recover not just a part or a system, but whole data centers. We're gonna walk through the different types of recovery sites, starting from the cheapest option, which requires the most time to recover, and building up to a redundant site, which costs a ton of money, but can potentially have zero town time if the primary site goes down. A cold site is just the shell of a building, 
No cabling has been run, network cables, power cables. No server racks are in place. No expensive equipment like servers, no data, and no people. So cheap, but it can take weeks to get a cold site up and running. A warm site is a shell of a building plus the cheap equipment like cabling and racks, but no expensive equipment like servers, no data, and no people. A little more expensive and recovery time is now down to days. A hot site is the building, the cheap equipment, and the expensive equipment all set up and ready to go. All that's missing is the data and the people to operate the site. Hot sites are much more expensive, but now our recovery time is down to hours. A mobile site is simply a hot site on wheels, typically a shipping container crammed with equipment. Mobile sites can be moved to where they're needed, and all that is required to get them up and running is data and people. So recovery times are hours, just like a hot site, or possibly days if you have to transport the mobile site across the country first. And that leads us to a redundant site. It has everything. A redundant site is a fully operational data center operating in parallel with the primary site. So huge cost, but recovery times can be seconds and possibly even instantaneous, depending on how it has been architected. The RTO, the recovery time objective, is what is going to drive an owner to select between these different recovery solutions. Any of these redundant sites should be built in a geographically remote location from the primary site. Geographically remote does not imply any exact distance, but rather far enough away from the primary site such that whatever disaster has befallen it, earthquake, hurricane, floods, wildfires, massive power outage, roaming llamas, whatever, will not affect the recovery site. And that is an overview of recovery site strategies within Domain 7, covering the most critical concepts to know for the CISSP exam. If you found this video helpful, you can hit the thumbs up button. And if you want to be notified when we release additional videos in this mind map series, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications. I'll provide links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Thanks very much for watching and all the best in your studies.